Uh, oh wait, no, yeah, we've got a wider, that's interesting. Let me pull this back. Yes. Oh, I could have done that. Yeah, that would have been smart. Okay. We're good. Hello, both people in the room and people online to our TOK talk number three for the 2023 IB essay. <laughs> our <laughs> key today that we will be discussing is, does it matter if our acquisition of knowledge happens in bubbles where some information and voices are excluded? We have a delightful panel here full of geniuses who are ready to debate at length and come up with some interesting questions and potential solutions to this prompt. If we go one at a time, starting over here on our far left, uh, we'll have our panelists introduce themselves uh, and then we'll begin our discussion. Hi, I'm Amy Park. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lucio. Hi, I'm Yvonne Bill. Hi, I'm Tom. Hi, I'm Marie. And I'm Mr. Henry. So, uh, we can start with an open uh, form here, if anyone has any initial thoughts or considerations that they would like to share. Maybe if we want this question with a yes or a no, and then we can dive in to particulars, maybe we'll start in the sound now, right? Just a yes or a no? Yeah. Yeah, it, it does matter, it matters a lot. Yeah. I would agree with it. Yes, it matters. It matters. Initially, yes, I thought that it mattered. Okay, good. So I think that starting with the understanding that there's general agreement with that part will allow us to kind of dive into the second half of the question, which is you know, where it gets a good bit grittier. Um, so in what way does it matter? I mean, I'll just jump in with a random thought, but sort of in any topic that you're talking about, if we're talking about, so I'm teaching in history, I'm teaching in folk, I'm teaching in the arts, um, uh, I've taught in music, I've taught in drama, but if we're looking at any, any topic, any piece, anything, we can look at a piece from one framing, if we use framing as a word, uh, if we look at it through the frame of Let's look, if you look at Shakespeare and you look at authentic Shakespeare and you look at the reality that uh, women were not allowed on stage. So you can look at, uh, hopefully I can remember my thought as I get through it, but, <laughs> but we can look at Shakespeare through the, the, um, the frame of sort of gender politics. We could look at through uh, from frames of gender equity. We could look at it from sort of, uh, if we were looking at a, a fellow, we could look at through a frame of, um, of sort of racial politics, things like that. So, or we could look at it through another lens of just literature, right? Or we could look at it in another lens of universal themes. Um, any frame that we look at it from, we will have to have a sort of a schema in mind, right? To know what we're talking about. And Mr. Johnson over there might have a very different schema in his mind when he's looking at certain kinds of literature than I might have. Um, Mr. Henrik might have another one, Ms. Park might have another one, and we are all looking at it. It's sort of the fable of the, uh, everyone you know is blindfolded and they're touching the elephant right in a different part, and they all have to say what it is, but they're all touching something so different that they all have a completely different description of what it is. So yes, how many voices are in the room in order to get a more complete picture of something, I think matters. Excellent. Any responses? Paul, what do you say? So yes, I, I, I thought that initially the answer of course is yes, of course it matters, right? And the more voices that we have, the less that are excluded, perhaps the more knowledge you know, we can, we acquire. But if I'm reading Shakespeare all by myself, in a room all by myself, that's my lens, right, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and I'm acquiring knowledge, mm -hmm. that knowledge is still valid and it's still legitimate and it's still my knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Do I have to have all, what, what voices are excluded? You know, knowledge is still acquired. So 
I think it makes, obviously it makes our understanding broader, the more voices that we have, but I think that knowledge is still required. So that's why, yes, it matters, but it's, it doesn't have to occur. So maybe we want to look at like the definition of like, what kind of knowledge do we want to achieve in the sense that uh, you might achieve a knowledge that is good enough for you to maybe understand in your case, for example, the, the work you're looking at, but maybe um, it is not knowledge that is applicable, for example, if you were to do an English literature exam or something like this, and maybe this uh, acquisition of knowledge uh, is flawed in the sense that um, you uh, may need some other point of view or you may need some uh, political context or, or historical context to the, to the plays. Uh, and so maybe it, it, it would help to define um, what type of knowledge is best to be acquired. Uh, so yeah, I agree with Ms. Park I, and on a general point of view as the question doesn't specify this. But on the other hand, um, I feel like, um, especially if we're talking about AOKs, the application of certain knowledge is important too. So maybe one wants to apply knowledge or use knowledge in their daily lives that is not flawed or maybe that is not incomplete. Also, when certain voices are excluded, that uh, leads to a pre pre prejudice, pre prejudice, prejudice, sorry, my English, uh, and that um, affects like um, how you assess the credibility of certain sources, certain voices, and um, that is gonna impact like not only what kind of knowledge you acquire, but also how you interpret or perceive certain knowledge in the future, and um, that can be dangerous in some situations, and then it matters if it has like a negative influ influence on the society, like for example, dictatorships, sorry to dive right into big examples, but um, the main goal of dictators is to create a societal bubble where everything stays on the inside and nothing can escape and nothing can come in. Uh, and that can lead to hateful ideas, intolerant ideas, can lead to even casualties and big, cruel horror stories um, um, in these societal bubbles that are created by people and where a lot of information is either false or excluded. I think that the, the voices here are, are our ways of validating the knowledge that we acquire. So from the juxtaposition from Ms. Park and Ms. Bell, uh, are that uh, one side they would talk about how a an, like addition of information voices will help in our acquisition of knowledge, while the other will say it's still considered knowledge even if we are totally alone. And I think that's a, a crucial part in considering uh, whether or not it matters. Well, in my case, even though I said yes, I'm not 100% sworn yet because sometimes it matters. For example, in uh, human sciences, uh, discoveries, breakthrough discoveries are usually done by some other voices that uh, oppress, for example, a woman or like, uh, a woman could uh, uh, her research uh, make a break breakthrough through medicine, and the society at that time would uh, oppress her down, and that would be a negative, a huge negative to the whole world. However, it's not exactly 100% correct that the large majority, which is the bubble, has complete validity of their knowledge. So that's my stance. So I thought that um, Marie's example was really good in the sense that um, um, knowledge on its own, I believe, is, um, I mean, in a way, it's kind of useless. I think knowledge is, as I said before, useful when it's applied. Uh, it may be in, in many different ways. Maybe it's communicated or maybe it's used uh, to, uh, to do uh, good judgment, like just having knowledge in our head doesn't, I, I don't feel like that doesn't really help us in any way. So as Marie said, like 
dictators uh, push on the fact that we are not, that their society um, is in a bubble, so they cannot revolt, for example. And so an example I wanted to bring forward was, for example, in Italy, um, we've had an election recently which was really controversial, and um, it was uh, propelled by the fact that there is a, a societal, a systemic uh, mistrust in politics, and as Marie said, there, there are prejudices when you're not confronted with other opinions, and many Italians are confined to their own home, so they live in a, a sort of bubble, and it has, of course, applications to the real world because um, electing, as we've seen, this government has like is, has a different migrant policy, and um, surely they will do some politics in the future, which will affect will have effects on the real world. So I think that um, again, it matters because even though you like because knowledge on its own doesn't get you anywhere and usually it is applied and that's when it's, it becomes useful. So it is actually important, I think. It does matter um, that, uh, well, again, uh, our acquisition uh, happens in bubbles. I think that Lucio mentioned a really important word which was judgment mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the bubble, the bubbles with which we are talking about um, influences uh, like how you assess sources and how you assess certain information based on assumptions that you acquire through your life experiences. Uh, and that can be also like dangerous like to go back to like the judgment, like judge itself. Like for example, in court, when someone gives a, I don't know, a testimony or someone is advocating for a thing, um, then it can be dangerous if you have certain <laughs> or assumptions, uh, and uh, people are gonna judge you differently um, based on an assumption they have because they are raised in a certain societal bubble, which can lead to racist thoughts, gender discriminating thoughts, ideas, uh, and that can be dangerous and harmful. So I thought the same thing <clears throat> that the word judge is really important when you're talking about how you acquire knowledge, but I wonder if we are perhaps um, connecting knowledge and empathy, and I think those two things are different, and you can acquire lots of knowledge, which, doesn't, which does not ensure that you will ever be empathetic, and dictators perhaps have a lot of knowledge, right, and perhaps have really important knowledge for their own ability to dominate and oppress that isn't taking away their idea that they don't have any empathy, but like those two, I don't think we can link those two things. If you have more knowledge, you have more empathy. It doesn't mean women's voices are going to be heard just because people are more knowledgeable. Yeah, I agree. I agree um, because uh, maybe uh, the reality is that when you do acquire knowledge about societal issues, maybe the, the result of your knowledge, like let's say there's a machine that uh, can acquire so much knowledge and so much numbers and statistics, that maybe the result of, uh, of this uh, machine is that actually the solution to a certain problem is something that we judge unethical or mm -hmm. not empathetic. So we, I don't think we are in a position to judge, again, like Ms. Park said, we shouldn't connect, yes, knowledge and empathy. And not, no, sorry, uh, what did you say? That's exactly oh, yeah, what I said. And well, and the word ethical, I think, is also very, you know, there's a, a lot of, <clears throat> Um, preconceived notions. There, there's a connotation to ethical that my idea might be very, very different from yours. I don't think being ethical means that you're knowledgeable, or if you're knowledgeable, that you are ethical. Yes. So I have a lot of notes here. I keep writing to everybody's things. Uh, so I'm trying to see how I can make them make sense and not be so uh, abstract, random, which is the way my mind works. Um, so I was thinking about what you were saying. Um, and the way that in a dictatorship, the, the, the information, the knowledge is definitely voices are excluded and definitely voices are oppressed. And there is sort of um, this sort of national shaping the narrative. There's a lot of uh, propaganda that kind of leans towards, you know, phraseology that is kind of a thought terminating kind of cliches. We see it a lot in American propaganda. Uh, it's rampant. Um, so I was thinking about that and the ways in which we control the narrative, 
was also thinking about what you said in that sometimes we need voices that come from outside the sort of systems that we're living inside in order to shine light on something that is there, but because of the schema, because of the systems, because of the way we're thinking of things are invisible to us, but people make them visible. And what I specific example was my students um, have been working on this idea of why even faced with uh, overwhelming amounts of fact and knowledge and science and history, can people still not change their mind in the face of reality? Um, and one example that you made me think of reminded me is the way Louis Leakey sent out Jane Goodall in the 1957 into Africa as a woman who was, a, she, she was fascinated with animals but had no college education. Um, and he wanted someone who was not male, not part of the science community, because he wanted someone who had the patience to just observe. And without um, placing a hypothesis first, could simply observe and take in information. And what she did was she made a whole connection uh, in terms of evolution visible that was previously invisible uh, to us because nobody had ever seen it before. So that was that what I was thinking of and shaping, narrating, that might be. Oh, and one of my students in another way that uh, things about language, I was thinking about this and in terms of Italian being a very gendered language. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing we often don't see is when we're still looking inside of our culture out. One of my students uh, from Japan was talking about this, that I think this idea of gendered languages is very strange for me and I think it opens the door to discrimination because it, it kind of lends this gendered color to the world that isn't present in his language. So all of those things, I think, speak to the idea of many voices shaping and reshaping the way we see the knowledge that we have. So. I think the contemplation of judgment is uh, interesting since it's, it's me, like the example of like how bubbles uh, as people, but um, what's my thing? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to think about uh, AOKs and art, and since like art is a very subjective uh, AOK, we, we tend to not think of uh, the artists having some other influence on them, some other voices telling them what to do. However, when we usually interview people, I think that uh, when the most uh, asked question is like, what inspires you, what uh, motivated you to do this, or uh, like on either on their general work or on a simple artwork, and they would sometimes they would answer uh, the name of person or event, or sometimes they would just say that they felt something. So I'm just curious about whether or not that was a process, process of ac uh, acquiring knowledge, and whether or not it was considered a bubble inside their own head if they had many thoughts during that. So it's interesting, so I wanted to bring that to the conversation. That's it. Yeah, so that's an example. <laughs> <laughs> like, he said art, he said art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a great example for application of knowledge. Like if I, if today I feel inspired by like the sunset or something, uh, and I'm an artist and I don't, I just, just feel inspired and that doesn't really help me or anyone else really, and then uh, actually, this is applied to like an artwork um, that actually does help other people because it may even inspire other people. So acquisition of knowledge and it, and its application may result in more acquisition of knowledge if you consider uh, in being inspired as acquiring knowledge. Um, and also, I wanted to go back to the point that Ms. Park made between uh, these uh, ethical decisions and uh, acquiring more knowledge. Um, like an AOK where I think this is important, for example, is economics. 
like there's many I mean not like a human scientists or economists like there's many um, decisions that um, big corporate firms make um, that um, we see an, uh, as unethical for example but um, on from an economics point of view those those may be uh, much much better than maybe what I think or what someone else thinks so actually acquiring knowledge in that case actually brings to an unethical decision so it may even bring like um, as, like uh, decisions that may be seen as like racist or or, or um, um, that don't account for gender equality and um, yeah so so maybe acquisition of knowledge is not always correlated but again as I said like I wanted to go back to the application and um, uh, as Tom just pointed out, it's a great example of how knowledge is applicated and it's not just in our head. What you make me think of is the idea of acquiring knowledge makes me question how do you acquire knowledge, right? And I'm a teacher and so I feel like I help in the process of people acquiring knowledge. But teaching is an inherently political act. Right? So what I choose to teach in, in my classes, the books that I pick, the, the lens from which I you know, um, uh, assess things or give assignments, it's all inherently political, right? It's all my lens and my bias. So you acquired knowledge that I wanted you to acquire, right? And then, and so you know, going back to your point, Tom, if I look at a piece of art and I say that makes me feel something, well, does that make me feel something because that idea was put in my head by someone else? Um, do I actually, is, do I have that feeling or do I feel as if I need to say I have that feeling, right? And then that makes me think of two things. One is, is what Miss Bill was talking about is that idea of language, right? Do I have the feeling because I have the language to name the feeling? But if my culture doesn't give me a word for that emotion, do I still feel it? Right? I was taught to feel these things because I have this language, but someone in, who, who speaks Portuguese, I know that they have a word that we don't have in English for a feeling that I think I could still feel if I could name it. Um, so, that, so that's one thing that I think, you know, how you acquire knowledge maybe even affects your own feelings, right? And then it also made me think of, so I did a little bit of homework so Mr. Hendricks sent us like these links that we could look at to, to prepare for this. And I looked at the one about Nietzsche and his, his idea that all that we don't have, that everything is faded. All of our thoughts are actually faded. Um, and because of my own things that I've already experienced, I can't have these thoughts. Like I, I don't get to choose the thoughts that I have and then therefore the actions that I have. So that gives me a really big sense of, um, responsibility, I think, as a teacher, helping you acquire knowledge, even having a conversation with Mucho in the cafeteria is a way in which, which we, we had about physics, and he actually helped me acquire knowledge. It's all inherently political. So, you know, how can acquiring knowledge even happen in a bubble if, if you're communicating with someone else or communicating with a text or whatever? So you meant to say that, like, lenses are created by society? So, like, just by society, or? I, meant to say, I don't know if I meant to say that. I think I meant to say that my lens is created for me because of the experiences that I've had. Okay. It's not an original thought, it's a thought that because of the of where I acquired my knowledge or who gave me that knowledge. Okay. I think that's what I meant to say. Mrs. Ford talked about um, the importance of labeling and awareness and um, I think that the bubbles um, are the ones who provide you with certain vocabulary and certain, I don't know, yeah, basically vocabulary and ideas. Um, and I think that, for example, um, you cannot really know yourself if you don't get the information to identify certain feelings. So for example, this is maybe abstract, so I'm going to use an example. So an example is the don't say gay bill in Florida. Uh, Flor is it Florida? Florida. In Florida. Um, so the exclusion of certain vocabulary is 
uh, harmful to people because they cannot name their feelings because um, identify uh, like labeling and identifying is confirming something um, and that is an example of where it is a where it can be harmful to one's identity and one's self feeling of self and one's feeling of belonging in a certain societal group um, and um, that's why we need to be careful with um, what sources we offer and because exactly what you said in the beginning about em em empathy um, including the voices from so many people will not automatically lead to empathy but the exclusion of it will lead mm -hmm. to intolerance and ap ap apathy so um, I think it's important to always give a range of everything and not exclude certain perspectives and certain vocabulary. Yeah, so this is what I would usually think and this is what I thought before I like discussing right now. I thought that uh, if we have um, certain lenses, right, and um, uh, I feel like this concept is really important. Let's say I'm intolerant towards a certain group of people and those people they come to me and they tell me about their struggles and why I shouldn't be. They try to convince me why I shouldn't be intolerant. So if I have a certain lens that, um, let's say I cannot change, it doesn't really matter uh, because I'm going to see what they say as if I'm intolerant towards them as a lie or as something that is, isn't true. So it doesn't really matter what they're going to tell me. I'm still going to be in my bubble through the lens that I have. And um, yeah, so maybe um, I'm, I agree. I agreed before coming here with this uh, more knowledge being more tolerable. But I feel like uh, I think we sh we should challenge this question in more detail. So I think that's the reason why we're here. So that's my this was my way of like challenging this argument. Especially, I think if the people who are coming to you to give their perspective are um, less powerful than you mm -hmm. are, right? They're coming to you as an oppressed group or a marginalized group, mm -hmm. and you are not in that group. I think that then their perspective is already, you're already skewed, exactly. right? Because because it's not a, a, a... From the same level. Yes, exactly. You know, oh, sorry. No, no, please, no, 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 I was just, yeah. So uh, you you made me think, Marie, of um, Adichie, the, the Nigerian author, you, you may have seen her TED talk, The Danger of a Single Story, but you were talking about the exclusion of words or the exclusion of perspectives as harmful. And she talks about that idea of how she only read um, British literature, because that's what was given to her. And so she never saw herself in any of the literature, right? She, on, she only saw little white girls uh, who were drinking tea, you know, who got cold in the winter. And, and that was her reality, that was her identity. She didn't know that there was any other sort of perspective and how dangerous that is to, to not, not only not know the words, but not even see yourself at all in the model of the knowledge that you're applying. So to build off of this, I think that we're in a really good space now. I think we've circled around in the, of course, bubbles are bad, uh, but I think we're actually at a place where we could potentially grapple with the idea that they could be good in certain circumstances. I think the example you just gave, um, what if this author said what was really important for me to grow as an artist and acquire knowledge about myself and how to represent myself is to read exclusively other Nigerian authors, to have a space for this knowledge not only to be accessed but potentially produced. I think it also ties in uh, to Tom's idea earlier when it comes to art. If you look at most art movements, I mean, the movements themselves are in a way bubbles looking mm -hmm. at each other, saying, what are we all doing in the circle? Maybe, yes, influence coming from abroad, but a lot of sort of internal um, relations happening. So I guess that's what I would prompt us to potentially consider. In what ways could bubbles, we all agree they matter, but potentially be beneficial? Or are they always inherently going to be uh, negative? Like, should we create them? Is what it, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wrote down here before, and it was kind of a, both uh, uh, Ms. Parka and Marie here were talking about these ideas, um, and I wrote down shared language, and I do think that that is one way in which bubbles can be a positive thing. So we have 
a shared way of talking about something that helps us. And I wrote here, while you were talking about the Don't Say Gay Bill, um, sort of the counterpoint to we should be able to say it. We should be able to name things. You were talking about naming things. And I was thinking about what you were saying in terms of like in this sort of matrix that we're in of our society, right? We see things from within that matrix. Um, how much agency do we actually have in our thoughts and our decisions and our opinions? And I wrote down here while you were talking, because it made me think of it, is that perhaps um, through that shared language, we increase our agency in, in increasing our shared language in naming. So the more we can name things, the more we can see them, and the more we can make choices about them, and so more agency we have. And maybe, maybe that's the kind of bubbles you want to be in, you know, the kind of bubbles where there's increased language, increased knowledge. So maybe this is a, uh, another thing that we have a positive connotation towards. Um, classic, I think uh, humans have a tendency to label things and to classify things. So um, I feel like um, um, I don't feel, uh, of course, I, I'm, not, I'm not for this bill. Um, I feel, but I feel like we should, uh, we should not risk um, making a bubble, uh, not necessarily language bubble, but uh, a bubble that we use to communicate knowledge um, could be in other ways. Uh, it shouldn't be, I feel like, too, too big because it risks to be counterproductive in a way. So there's this um, expression we say in Italian, it's called uh, beata ignoranza, it means the beauty of being uh, ignorant. So I mean, usually you use this in a negative connotation, mm -hmm. meaning that ignorant people, they do not know about the problems of the world or something like this, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe to some extent, or one that is knowledgeable and wants to acquire knowledge, uh, may not be. It may not be the best and more productive thing to have uh, too many classifications and too many ways of expressing knowledge. And so, as Mr. Hendrix said, there were certain art movements um, that were a certain bubble. Maybe uh, if one were producing art, incorporating many methods of like painting or, or sculpting, um, that would be counterproductive to the movement itself and wouldn't render the movement original. But uh, the bubble that was created uh, is good and it shouldn't be bigger um, than it already is. So I'm not saying that right now language is, is too big of a bubble. I'm just saying, generally speaking, that maybe we don't want to risk uh, having a bubble that's too big because it may be counterproductive. We have that same saying. We say ignorance is bliss. Oh, okay. Yeah, I <laughs> so, didn't know about it. Yeah. Same idea. But I think we also have another saying, preaching to the choir. Yes. Right? So, like, that's the bubble we created, right? And to me, like, don't we do that? I mean, we, we do create our bubbles, right? We want to preach to the choir, meaning like, I want to talk to the people who validate my, my ideas. Um, and I think that we force ourselves to find the people who challenge us, but like, so I think there's that. We already do it. Um, and, then, and then our knowledge is validated anyway, right? Um, but I think what you're saying about like, let's say art movements are often like, they're only defined because they are in response to or negating what is already there. And so you're right, it is really important and I think it, to define those boundaries of like, this is our movement so that we can then compare it to the others because that makes us original. So I think that's a good point. Like if we incorporate everything, then we aren't moving. Yes, and also um, another point I want to bring and I, this applies to the school. So before I come here, I thought, um, oh, I, I, like, I was raised to be like in a way international in the sense open-minded, uh, and uh, I was very happy to the thought of coming here to meet new people and from different nations. But I've seen a tendency, uh, I would say like a 50-50 split of 50% uh, of people, they are really like outgoing and speaking to many people from different nations, but the other 50% creating their bubbles within their like own nations and I'm guilty of it on my own, that I hang out mostly with Italians and Germans. Um, and uh, so, so maybe in this case, um, it actually helps indirectly. One wouldn't think about it, but my acquisition of knowledge in the school is not only about other cultures, but also like in the classroom. So maybe m me being in a context
topics that I am familiar with. So like hanging out with German people or Italian people, it's actually helping me in acquiring knowledge because I may be in a psychological state that is more favorable to me being in class and me being productive in class and not having to worry, oh, I'm excluded because I'm from this nationality. So maybe this could be an example. Of course, I think that everyone in the school has interactions with other people from other nations and it's happening for me right now as well. So, and it happens every day. But sometimes, uh, going back to that bubble, and as Ms. Park said, we tend to do this, I think, because we're more comfortable. And she said, we force ourselves to confront ourselves with other people because maybe we know that that will be helpful uh, to acquire more knowledge. But sometimes, if we're acquiring knowledge not about other cultures, but about other things, it may be comforting to be in a group that, so in a choir, in a sense, that we're preaching to a choir, in a, for example, in this case, in a group that is from your, your own nation. And to put a term to that, um, that's normally referred to as, I guess, safe space. Safe space, right? yes, So, exactly. I mean, this is something that is um, common and becoming more common throughout the United States, especially in uh, universities, uh, places where, for these exact reasons you're speaking of, um, areas are set aside so that they're, it's, and it's often talked about as things hindering the acquisition of knowledge, other dynamics, and being in a space that makes you feel safe, which might be cultural, um, gender, racial, sexuality, um, lets you actually not feel as safe. Mm -hmm. But yeah, just wanted to bring that in. Also, um, in these safe spaces where people are in their comfort zones, um, communicate, uh, or I mean, decision making is much more effective, depends on, on which way you view it. Um, but I think we can all agree that if you have um, like minded people together, it's much easier to get along and to reach a consensus than when you try to do that with people from all over the world. I mean, look at international politics, it's really hard uh, because everyone has their has their own interests. Uh, like when they try to reach a consensus about climate change, it's impossible because all countries have their own interests to look at, so it's really ineffective. So sometimes um, when people in a bubble create solutions, um, they come with much more effective, um, conclude, how do you say, conclusions, much more effective propositions um, because it's less impossible to reach consensus when you are in bubbles. Look at the US. I mean, our, our political system, you know, if, if the Democrats just got the Senate, maybe perhaps some things can move forward, but even within our own, you know, one country, mm -hmm. we can't we can't move forward if there isn't a majority of like minded people. Yeah, that's yeah. why it's that's why maybe sometimes it's counterproductive to get out of the bubble mm -hmm. and listen to more opinions because like uh, as Marie said, like decision making. So we make a decision, we decide to act on something, and maybe it's good, it's a force of good to be with pe like-minded people, because if you're not, then you're wasting your time discussing about ideas, and instead you act on those ideas if you're with like-minded people. I think it's uh, the, the comfort comfortability of being in a similar uh, like-minded people group with you. Uh, I think it's beneficial for the person because it uh, it eliminates their anxiety of being like like uh, Richard said uh, exclusive excluded and I think uh, one of the I want to bring uh, social media into here well like like a whole bunch of bubbles and uh, during time of COVID I think there's a lot of uh, false uh, information uh, circling around how to like get rid of COVID and all of these are done due to people's demand of like and uh, people's demand for like a solution for COVID and they just want to hear something that's comforting but also uh, in a more positive light I think social media brings a place where a large group of people can be educated in like one press of a button one upload or a chance to newspaper, to news time, they provide a lot of information that's uh, validated. And I think that's the benefit of like having a bubble of like, a bubble that we can rely on to uh, 
achieve that knowledge in about a day. Maybe the safe space takes away that power dynamic mm -hmm. too. Yes, because you're both on the phone. And, yeah. yeah, you you chose you chose that bubble, mm -hmm. so it levels. Yeah, any sort of. But also the opposite is true about social media because social media essentially pops the bubbles where we're like which we are in, like for example at home because we have this little device and we can escape to all literally all other possible bubbles in the world just through clicks on a screen. So yeah, it both you can both yeah, it's a choice, I think both benefit for itself. I think that goes back to Nietzsche though. Mm -hmm. And it, was it all predetermined? Because you clicked that, and so the algorithm is pushing you that way. Like, do you get a choice of where you click? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and choice of free will. Right. Yeah, it's unconscious choices that we make. It's based on our, it's like it's built into our system where we don't really think of what we're doing, and we just uh, unconsciously do it, like using our system. So. I think that leads to like confirmation bias. Um, because I have a certain view on things and seeing, uh, in my opinion, like from my perspective, I can maybe think, oh, I have such a wide variety of sources that I can pick from, but essentially all these sources just confirm my opinion and add to my idea about things. And that can also be dangerous, but it also unavoidable maybe I can't remember what this article was called it was a few years back and I don't I'm not gonna remember much about it but do you remember this the death of the death of the expert or something it was like yeah, about book, yeah. yeah so the idea that um, this this idea in America where education is pretty uneven right and everybody's got a voice and free speech say whatever you want that um, it's sort of like the rise of Dunning-Kruger effect, right, throughout the population, and the. Can you explain Dunning-Kruger? So, okay, so, <laughs> okay. so the 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 more the the less you know, the smarter you think you are, and the smarter you are, the less you think you know, right? Is that is that a good, simple definition of Dunning-Kruger? Yeah, good enough. Okay, um, but it is really true. Like sometimes people come up to me as I so my my. My degrees are more in, I have a master's degree in music and um, other things like that. But sometimes people will come to me and offer to people who are not, have no very little about music, or maybe they played clarinet in high school or something. And they'll come and offer me some technical advice about music. And I don't, I rarely say much back, but sometimes I'm like, huh. That's very interesting. And I just kind of go, wow, people really think that 11 years of higher education in a topic can be summarized by all I have to do is perhaps raise my eyebrows to fix my pitch. Okay, so I guess I didn't need to go to school. But, uh, but there's this, uh, this sort of like, do you know the idea that it, you know, or the idea, you know, with the, the idea in the, um, behind the curve. The idea that you don't really need to be an astrophysicist to understand the curvature of the Earth, and, <laughs> and, and you know, being an astronaut really doesn't define like what we know about space, and all I need to do is like stand over here, and if I can see Seattle, we're good. The Earth's flat, bro. So it's just that whole thinking of the kind of the death of the expert, and how that, in that way, a bubble, I do think is good. Like, I really, do, I'm sorry, y'all, but I don't really want to talk to you about vocal technique if you haven't had a voice lesson. Like, if, <laughs> unless you're taking one from me, I don't really want to talk to you about it because it's, it's, you know, and I'm sure, you know, our, our teacher over there would probably not want to, I, she's not going to want to talk with me about, you know, I, mean, I have my opinions about art. It doesn't mean I, it doesn't mean you can't have your opinions about music. It doesn't mean I don't, can't have my opinions about art or science, but please don't tell me what, you know, of what it is, like in terms of being, you know, does that make sense? Am I making sense, yeah. Tina? Okay. And I think that sets us up for um, 
really interesting new space that we're entering in, which is the largest divide globally in terms of bubbles, I would argue, has to do with um, college education versus sometimes not even down to high school education, right? Yeah. If you look globally, um, especially when you look at who's in control of media companies, uh, who their uh, markets are towards, uh, and it's overwhelmingly, like Bill Bernie said, a certain type of view of the world, a certain type of understanding the world that's influenced and shaped by a university education. Um, which leads us to a difficult and troubling question, which is uh, we, I think, generally think that an education is not only useful, but provides more expertise. However, it's clear that people are revolting against turning away from this expertise because they don't see themselves going to spaces represented, um, people with their viewpoints. And yet there is this tension of, well, do we want to have a bunch of non-experts represented, telling people information and advising them how to act in medical fields and other different spaces? And so I think this is a really deep tension, which is, uh, and it kind of gets to the duality of what we've been discussing this whole time, which is, in a way, um, people with less education feel like there's these lack of safe spaces for them. And yet those safe spaces can often be ripe with misinformation because of that same lack of education and expertise. I don't really quite know what to do right now. Uh, and I think they gravitate towards those spaces. Uh, coming from you know a family in the Midwest where not everybody goes to college, but bright people who want to feel like they know things. So they'll take a shortcut and go to a you know, a confirmation bias, I think you said chat room or whatever, where what they hope to believe is confirmed, and there's a lot of terminology thrown around, and they can say, well, you know, this is the, I can, you know, my sister who has no, well, she wants us to have no college education, feels free to comment on the markets to me, and I, I you know, I'm not an economist, but I know she got that information in a Cliff's Notes version somewhere, because if pressed, she's not going to be able to explain to me why she thinks that, you know, and, and, and it's not my space either, so I'm not going to be able to adequately refute her point of view, right? So we, we are living in an information overload. It makes many of us feel not very smart, so we go to, you know, abstracts and quick versions and summaries of vast, you know, Brene Brown talks about that, like we're, our, our default is to pretend we know rather than just say, wow, I don't know anything about that. And we don't want to say that because it, it, isn't, it, isn't, it doesn't make us seem smart enough in this world. But maybe um, the, um, I agree with the point of view that, well, I mean, I, I don't know what the point of view is, but like, I feel that um, someone maybe with a college degree, of course, has a better knowledge of, of that topic. Um, but in a way, um, this creates a dynamic where uh, we were talking before of like one person being above and the other being below. So uh, this created a dynamic where, oh, here's the college degree, here's the other people. But in a way, this is so, sort of like, oh, this is the highest point. So it's almost as if we were connotating that someone with a college degree has like, a, I wouldn't say perfect, but near perfect knowledge, but um, if we take the concept of lenses we used before, there are some um, people that may have a college degree, but maybe um, they have their own lens of seeing things, uh, and so their knowledge is flawed and their application is flawed, and I think that's, for example, a reason why when you have like a medical problem, you do not go to one medical professional, but you go to multiple, even though may, maybe all three people you go to have the same college degree, or maybe have or they all have a master's, but they have different lenses, way, different ways of thinking. So I, it's really difficult to, um, I, I, I agree with the classification in a way that that maybe someone with a college degree is higher, but it doesn't mean that all of those people um, are in a way perfect in terms of knowledge, but um, uh, they may have, may even 
uh, be at the same level of someone without a college degree because they have a certain lens through which they see things. I, I was thinking that, not as eloquently as you said it, but I was thinking about that, I, this sort of snobbery mm -hmm, yes. around um, education mm -hmm. and, and defining what knowledge is and knowledge is something that we can read in a book and sit in a lecture and have enough money to go to university to learn these things because that also is inherently political. Um, and often what, what are we taught in high school? Who succeeds in high school? Well, that depends, right, on socioeconomically, did you have books in your home? Are you able to sit in a desk and listen? Or do you have some other way that you need to learn that is not really taught you know, in a traditional kind of setting, you weren't successful in high school, do you get to then go to college? Does that mean your knowledge acquisition is any less than that person who was able to sit and get all the homework done and has the executive functioning to be successful? Yeah. I'm thinking about my own daughters who are both very smart in very different ways and in one traditional education works super well for her. Mm -hmm. She'll go to college, no problem. The other one is super smart too. Traditional education doesn't work well for her. So. Do, you know, where, where's the knowledge acquisition? I think it's very, very layered in what you said is true. When you start going like this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's dangerous. And also, that's, um, that's the, what we were talking about ethics before. Like, um, this may be like true, like maybe good from a certain point of view that some people, um, I, I mean, I, I don't want to say that it's good that someone doesn't get an education, but maybe someone doesn't get an education and someone does so maybe this is I mean it's uh, at the end it's like a, kind of a zero-sum game so um, what is really ethical like how do you uh, like we, we from a certain point of view our knowledge brings us uh, to the conclusion oh it's good that these people went to university because they great they did great things in their jobs but uh, how do we judge if it's like a bad thing that the other people didn't go and I think and I totally agree with what Oh, no, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to elaborate on what both of you said. Um, so first, I wanted to um, talk about like how the um, bubbles can be positive um, in terms of university classroom, college classroom. I don't know how you do call the classroom in college. Mm -hmm. uh, it provides um, these bubbles um, that um, offer you accurate knowledge offer you a chance to think critical about the knowledge that's offered to you. But when these bubbles are not not offered to you, you are going to look for these other alternatives when the knowledge is not that accurate or not that effective, which can lead to like a interpretation or application of the knowledge that is not reliable and can be seen as um, less than someone who is an expert. Um, so in that sense, um, the bubbles are good because it provides you with the, the necessary information to think critical and to have a good interpretation of it. But then the other problem is um, that um, people become more illegible because of certain inequalities and essentially a piece of paper. And that is another um, problem because some people are so well know so much about the topic from independent study and then they are seen as not serious because they didn't go to college like my dad for example uh, my dad didn't go to college but he knows probably more than any uh, other person in his uh, profession how to effectively be a salesperson so I think there is also a really big problem of how education uh, or uneducated people are regarded as less than people who got an education even though i think that these bubbles that provide you with the necessary knowledge are really effective in most cases yeah so maybe that's the difference between practice and theory so that's the same thing for my father too uh he was an advanced like he worked in arts and he, he couldn't study arts in college but he has studied through his work um, and of course, maybe he doesn't know the dates of a certain painting, or but he knows the practical aspects of certain things and uh, of selling certain things. So 
Yeah, so I agree with Marie that in the end, it's 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 a little bit it's a little bit interesting to think about that. It's in the, in the end, it's just a piece of paper that you're hanging on your wall that validates. But of course, it's those classifications that we need in society. I think mm -hmm. because I mean, how do you prove that you are good at doing something? Um, what is a test you can use to do so? You cannot really do it, uh, and that's why we use those pieces of paper and we say, oh, that that proves what I what I want to want, what I want to show you. So uh, it's interesting because because I agree with you. I think that there. Are, I don't think college is the only path to educate, being educated or ways of knowing. Um, and I just read an article because for a research project I have to do for my degree I'm working on now, but about the college industrial complex and the idea that some of that emerged in the 60s when certain kinds of tests for employment for certain skills that would have been skills based and you might have learned them from a mentor or a disciple you know it's something they could then test those skills and you could be employable and college you were still obviously you're educated because you had those skills but you, college wasn't the only path to those education at one point i forget what the law is called a law was passed those those skills tests were now no longer considered legal. Employers no longer knew exactly how to determine if someone would, like a pool of applicants could would be, you know, legitimate for what they needed. So they just started using a bachelor's degree as a as a barrier to employment for Americans, which is one of the that there is an idea that we're working on this for a class of mine out there that. That is part of what has led to the current student loan debt crisis in that many, many people could no longer be employed because of the skills they had. They had to get a college degree in order to be employed and often what they got in terms of their college degree, the skills had nothing to do with the job that they actually were trying to get. They weren't learning the skills they needed for that job. They just had to have it because it was a, a sort of like blanket barrier to employment. So. Yes, I think there's many other ways to be educated. Um, anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, that's what happens in like in Kinto too. Like people, they say, "Oh, I'm just gonna take an easy major because I need to have at least one degree." Mm -hmm. That's counterproductive because those years you may have like uh, used to learn a profession better. And uh, although I'm, uh, uh, I, I'm all for knowledge and. Uh, like uh, going to university and, and theory, but also on another side, one must, I think, be productive. And so um, taking three or four years of your life to do a major, which does have, which has nothing to do with your, with your job, or maybe you won't even use the knowledge in your life. That's, yeah, that's counterproductive. Great, and I think at this point, we're going to turn it over to some questions from the audience. I do want us to um, hopefully be dissuaded from the clearly false notion that <laughs> philosophy is an easy degree, which I have heard multiple <laughs> times. <laughs> Not from this table. But I, I think, clearly the discussion that we're having is a demonstration of its value. And, uh, Actually, I wanted to say political science, but Oh, oh, okay. All right, you want uh, an easy degree, go into music. Let's turn it over to the crowd. Do we have any questions uh, from the audience about yeah. anything that came up? Yeah. How do you value if something matters? Like, how would you guys value if something matters in it, like in acquiring knowledge? How do you value it? Has it implications on society? So, it ma who, do, who does it? Um, it matters to whom? So, it matters to us. So, does it have implication or effects on us, uh, on society? So, I think that's the way you could evaluate. Oh, it matters or it doesn't matter. So, it definitely when, influences us in any way. Because when I read the question originally, I was thinking of something that you guys mentioned about. Um, you know, where you draw the line, how you figure out if there is a hierarchy, if there is a power struggle. And I thought of it from the perspective of like an indigenous culture. And I thought about colonizers who frequently think 
their ideas matter so much that they're going to acquire knowledge onto excluded people. <laughs> so I was wondering how you evaluate who does it matter to? Like, does it matter to the knower or to the culture or to the community? I think that's the reason why we choose to go to college is because of the safety net that they place under the degree that we graduated. And that's what most people are pushed into the bubbles that we are talking about right now. It's because of the the wages, the working force, the, the, the reason why we get education at all is because it's beneficial for our society and how it's built up. And I think the question of who it's beneficial to varies from person to person because, for example, a triathlon, you could uh, knowledge, uh, like the, the, the hunters could go out and they would spot something, but they don't have the uh, available equipment, for example, a bow to hunt a deer. So they go back to the tribe and they ask maybe a, uh, a weapon maker. I, I, I don't know what's the name for them. But <laughs> they, they would uh, make the bow. And then the, the, the value of the knowledge that there's a deer here is crucial for the guy making the bow because it, it allows him to have a, a job, a duty in the tribe and provides him value for himself. So I think the, uh, the, the, the question of whom it's affecting and or whom it's important to, it's based on the values that that person carries. Also, before we started, the first thing I said to Mr. Johnson was like, oh, why didn't they make it? Why would it matter if our acquisition of knowledge happens in bubbles where some information and voices are being excluded? I think the fact that we all had an immediate answer to the question, why would it matter or why does it matter? I think shows immediately that that it does matter because we have an immediate response to to it. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So it's more like a, my statement than a question. So I thought that sometimes we need bubbles and sometimes we should exclude some information because I think bubble is like a filter like it's a filter that like it gives filtered knowledge to us and then I think it was necessary in some place or some people because when I there was like a um, big incident in Korea a few weeks ago and then hundreds of people died and when I scroll down on the Instagram, I watch a video, people mm -hmm. dying in the crowd, and it was so traumatic. And since I can see the dead bodies in between the people, and then just, and then I Im immediately skipped the video, but it was like remember, it was remaining like like in my brain like a picture, and then that scene is like still inside of my head and then I thought but I didn't like pull off that information like I didn't want it to like watch the video but since the social media didn't really protect me from those information they don't really filter it I think well, so that's why I I hate to say this to you but they did filter but they are incentivized towards showing you that content, right? I mean, that's that's the, the dangerous thing here. And I've stepped a little bit out of my moderator bounds here. <laughs> um, but I think it is important for us to be aware that uh, it is a, very much a deliberate filtration process to give you content that isn't necessarily, uh, well, not necessarily, is not concerned about well-being, is concerned about attention, right? And even though um, that, pushed you too far to get you off of it. Um, that sort of salacious and... But I thought maybe they should give me like a choice mm -hmm. to watch mm -hmm. it or not. Because for for example, like Twitter, I think they have, if, if I log into account, they just skip those like 
information. They have like privacy protocol that you don't see those kind of um, controversial information before you click to say yes, yeah, I want to see it. But since other platform that I was like logged in was didn't really had those stuff and maybe I just didn't read the protocol like in detail enough and I just say yes mm -hmm. or something. But then yeah, that's what I got the information and then I thought that's why I need sometimes like filtered information. I think it's really interesting that you talk about the exclusion of controversial things. Uh, because that is where the whole cancel culture these days comes from. Um, that is like as much as I am someone who like advocates for everyone's voices to be heard. Um, I also admit that I am not gonna um, voluntarily um, always gonna listen to homophobic and anti-Semitic and racist comments, and it should um, obviously not exist. But on the other hand. If we delete the voices of these people, we don't necessarily delete their ideas. And um, so I think we have to find a balance between um, showing that these ideas exist, but uh, and that this this kind of content exists, and like raise awareness about it. But on the other side, not let them indoctrinate. Um, I agree with that, Others. but at the same time, we need some. I think we need like some time or enough education before we like face those facts or truth. Because sometimes you don't really have your own perspective. You can just like go with the crowd. I, I mean, like we you cannot really have your opinion, but you can just like switch with like other opinions. Kind of, you're saying that that maybe um, students should have certain kinds of bubbles to protect yeah. them for things they're not ready for. I agree with you. Um, and, 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 and developmentally at different ages, mm -hmm. you know, you have to be careful what a fifth grader sees as opposed to a, a seventh grader as opposed yeah. to a ninth grader. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're not. I agree, I, I agree <laughs> with you, I guess is what I should say. Yeah. That's the better way to say it. And that's where acquisition of knowledge crosses ethics. Like, you, you maybe you want to see it and that is fine, but that's how, like, oh, you, I increased my knowledge and I increased my knowledge by looking at this video, but now uh, it's this acquisition in a way may be unethical to you because now you are you are, you have your trauma of this seeing this video. Yeah, what comes to Yeah, I agree that it is sometimes necessary to make bubbles to protect, like, people. I remember being, like, I don't know, five years old and looking at um, terroristic attacks and seeing bombs and being mm -hmm. traumatized. So I think that these bubbles, like especially for children, to protect people from certain information is necessary. But then who is the protector? Mm -hmm. Who makes the choice to say that Jihu is not able to see this right now, right? But Marie can. That's also inherently political, and that's when we get to like censoring things, and that's when we start taking books out of libraries because what if we put those scary thoughts in people's in children's minds, right? And so when when you were talking about, um, you know, everyone's voices being heard, even though we would like to silence the ones that we feel are dangerous, mm -hmm. I was thinking of, about the whole movement of political correctness mm -hmm. um, that was was sort of that people kind of blamed Obama for, I guess, that like now no one is able to say anything, we have to censor all things. My politics lean towards that, but then all of a sudden, all of these people who have who felt as if they were being silenced now have this voice um, that, that personally, I think, you know, Trump helped give them. And I started to think that's wrong. Those people shouldn't be, we shouldn't hear those racist, homophobic, you know, in my mind, small-minded, those people's opinions are just as valid as mine. I think they're dangerous, but they think mine are. And so look what we've done to this whole group of people who feels completely disenfranchised that now that they have a voice, they should, right? Like why should I be the, the stopper of knowledge just because I think mine's right? So to, I think also to validate Jiju's thought right here, I think thinking along the lines of sensory modality is better. Like we are biological creatures, right? And there's certain sorts of sensory intakes of information that might be more not only visceral but traumatizing. 
uh, I was just racking through my mind. Uh, the only time I can ever remember having to stop reading something for a length of time was when I was reading Lolita. Mm. There was one or two sections where I just went, holy, I can't. But when I compare that to the number of images I've experienced in my life where it was just overpoweringly um, traumatic, uh, I think that that can maybe point to differences in the acquisition of knowledge needed and, you know, how much safe space are you given? How much information ahead of time? Are you, I mean, the thing about an image too, sorry, I'm going off a little bit. The thing about an image too is yes, you can close your eyes and look away. When, you, when you're reading, it's much more of a, a participatory act, mm -hmm. right? So you can feel it's going in a weird place. I mean, almost never is it gonna be a single word that's gonna stop you. It's gonna be a sentence or an idea that starts where you go. But an image, it's that, it's instant, right? And you didn't get to choose it. Exactly. I choose the image in my head of the, you know exactly. what's happening in Lolita, and I stop right there because I don't want to see any yeah. more of that. But like, yeah, you're right. Someone else chose that image. It's just. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, I would like to know um, what if you guys think like to what extent are people aware of being in bubbles when they are in a bubble? Because when I was in Germany, I took like a politics class and we had like a whole section about like social media algorithm because I mean the algorithm doesn't show you stuff that you don't really you aren't really interested about I mean me for example I don't have like transphobic people or anything like that on my feed but then again when I see like um like results from votes in Germany, I'm always really surprised to see like that right parties get like 15% votes and stuff. And then at the same time, we're having this problem that only a little more than 50% of people vote. And I was thinking maybe like being in a bubble makes people not being aware of, like, I feel like if people are in a bubble and they only see other people believing in the same ideas, they don't feel this need to vote because they think that, you know, everything's going to turn out kind of the way I want it to. So I, I'm wondering if like maybe not really being aware of being a bubble can be a problem or if that's even like a thing. That's good. So uh, to phrase the question and tell me if I'm right here, it seems like your concern kind of gets at uh, earlier comment about efficiency, right? We were talking about bubbles promoting efficiency, but this seems like an example of bubbles actually being a hindrance to efficiency, especially in the political arena, because you're not faced with the realities of how many people believe differently than you do. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. What do you think? Um, so, I might, I'm just, I'm always going to sound like I'm slightly off track, so just roll with it. Um, <laughs> so there's this historian I was listening to a lot this summer. His name is David Christian. He talks about big history. Um, and one of the themes that he talks about in terms of if, you, if you're starting with the Big Bang and you're going through single cell organisms and then you're moving on through, you know, all the way through the dinosaurs up to the hunter-gatherers, then you've got the rise of civilization, that essentially we are dealing biologically, historically, in every way with rising complexity. Um, we are historically the largest human population ever, right? And we're, and it just keeps going. Eight billion as of today. Right, so uh, what I've been thinking about in terms of this issue is that, especially politically, right? We're dealing with, um, worldwide rising complexity in every possible way. We're dealing with it technologically, we're dealing with it medically, we're dealing with it artistically, we're dealing with it in every possible way. Um, and there's another idea that I've been thinking about, which is cognitive load. How much can one person absorb, process, understand, be able to determine as knowledge in their life uh, if I am really interested in whether or not um, 
I can learn this piece of music and teach my class and go to school and do this and do that. How much time do I have cognitively left and drive to hockey practice for my son? How much time do I cognitively left have to take the um, all the claims of each political person and evaluate them? And then, then maybe compare it to their record. Like what have they actually done? How have they voted? How has that affected me? How has that affected various you know, say we consider 10 different viewpoints in terms of marginalized or not marginalized groups of power. It's too much. So what have politicians done? What are propagandists done? They have, and what did Trump do so efficiently? He, he, he distilled language down to a few catch phrases, many of which are excellent, powerful, thought terminating cliches that people can wrap themselves around. And all you have to do is put a few of them in an ad for somebody who can't pay their bills, for somebody who can't find a job, for somebody who feels looked down by, upon, by the educational or the intellectual community, and, and make them for the first time be seen. They're people too. You know? And we tend to dehumanize anybody that thinks radically different than us. But, and politics dehumanizes sort of across the board. So I think what happens is, and Brene Brown says, people are really hard to hate close up. And what happens is that we get into our camps and we, we read the propaganda short, because you know I got a lot of work to do today and I've got homework and I've got classes to plan and I've got hockey practice to get my son to. I really only have about five minutes to think about this political idea. And I think that depending on what your particular, wherever your economic uh, situation is, your social structure, what you were raised, your, all of the things that make you who you are, whatever catchphrases are going to seem to address the concerns that you have, that's what's going to, that's where you're going to vote. And, and I think we have a lot of people who are working three jobs just to try to feed their children, and they simply don't have time to get knowledge in the way that much of the intellectual community thinks everybody should have, because we've all got plenty of time to think about what matters in the world. Well, no, some people just need to feed their children. And so Trump was really brilliant with throwing those one-liners out and catching people's attention. And I think it happens in every country. And I think when you're seeing that rise in right-wing politics, it's because people aren't being heard. And they think this guy is very that's what I think. I see a lot of notes. So, I have a lot of thoughts about this. Um, the, the first thing, I, I was going to say that um, something that I don't really stand by, but my initial idea was um, not being aware of, your, of a bubble can come from both a position of privilege or a position of ignorance or a position of not having the resources. So when you're privileged, that you don't have to worry about being oppressed. You don't have to worry about being marginalized. You don't have to worry about um, other groups of society but your own because you have it well. So I think that is one reason why people would not be aware of bubbles. Another one is like Ms. Zville said, people have their priorities. And if your priority is just to get through the month with the loan you get from from your job, then you're not gonna worry about oh no, my knowledge happens in bubbles, and I have a certain idea that is maybe not the most critical, um, because people have different um, priorities. Um, and um, then on the other hand, um, you can you know, be really aware of bubbles because of a like a, a privilege because you're privileged like we can be real because we have the resources and um, marginalized groups can be also really aware of bubbles because they are this uh, bubble that is not part of the the bigger the bigger one so it's hard for them to get into the bigger bubble society so i think that um it's really hard because it's such an individual Thing and it's so, so much about priorities, I think. 
um, that it's hard to assess um, or um, break the awareness of, of, of bubbles because so many factors are involved and it's just what you do with your with your position essentially I think. Excellent. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? All right.